Welcome to Entrepreneur State of Mind. I'm your host, Dr. Dale Caldwell, and I happen to have today a, a very, very good friend and the founder of Human Advantage, Eric Gutoff. Eric, how are you doing today? Great, Dale. I'm excited to be here. I appreciate you having me. The, one of the things I love about I've known Eric for, for a little over a year now, and so, but on these shows, I always like to learn some more things. So, so Eric, where did you grow up? Where did you go to high school, and uh, you know, how did you get into this sports world? Yeah, it's a good, it's a, you know, I, I, um, I got into it, not the traditional path, but I, I grew up in um, Yonkers, New York, um, and then Springfield, New Jersey, till I was you know, about eight, and then I moved to Ohio. My dad got transferred, and so I guess I really grew up in Ohio from eight through college. Went to high school in Westerville, Ohio. Went to college in Miami of Ohio, and I, I studied uh, a zoology, um, believe it or not, as a pre-med major. So I was planning to go to med school, and they told me... Uh, I should study zoology to get into med school, and I follow directions. So um, I was uh, accepted into Ohio State, and the story goes that I want—I love to travel. I wanted to travel the country and pitch the American Cancer Society to go to all the baseball parks and educate kids about smokeless tobacco. That launched the Great American Ballpark Tour. So me and two of my friends just graduated college uh, the summer after that was 98, summer 98, Traveled the country, went to all the ballparks, and uh, raised a bunch of money. Had a, a the time of our lives. Then I did a year of med school, <laughs> and then I realized I was a lot more interested in what I had done that past summer. So I pivoted, and uh, and that that's what really got me into sport. Is I would say the ballpark tour, and then I've always been a sports kind of fanatic. I uh, I collected cards and, and and memorabilia when I was a kid, and I turned it into a business when I was in middle school. So. I was an entrepreneur at a young age, and yes. sport and entrepreneurship are kind of interwoven throughout my life now. So entrepreneur state of mind, I mean, that's, that's a pretty, it's amazing. When you told me, first told me that story about the baseball parks, I mean, that is pretty incredible. That's a lot of chutzpah. Of course, yeah. medical school is going to pale in comparison to that. What's better than that? So, so how were you able to swing that? What, what was, uh, how, did, how did you use your entrepreneurial skills to convince them to allow you to do that? I don't know, Dale. I don't know. I don't know. I'll tell you, like, if you fast forward to this this era era of sponsorship and how big the business has gotten, yeah. you know, just I don't think I, we could have done it. I think it was at a time where, you know, I was resilient. I was convincing. I was, a, you know, a good person. And the American Cancer Society gave me and two of my friends their brand wow. by, to travel the country, which which is you know, we didn't have contracts or agreements. It was kind of go out and raise some money for us, right. and we did. And so I just think it, it, it you know, I'm, I built a business out of a hobby when I was a kid, and I think that's just in my DNA. I look for opportunities to, to, to build things out of, out of other things. And I think the sports cards business led to the ballpark tour, and the ballpark tour led to my career, and the companies that I've been a part of and founded uh, in my career. Well, yeah, I mean, one, you're you're a good guy, but you're you're very much a people person. So that has that has permeated throughout. So so all right. So you left medical school, and then what what did you do? You know, what did how did you get into this the sports world? And and I know the Olympic movement. Yeah. Well, my dad's a, an executive search person. He had his own company at that time that I left med school, and I remember just going to his office. Uh, and just sending out resumes and cover letters, like, you know, hundreds of them mm -hmm. trying to get into sports. I, I remember I interviewed with the Columbus Clippers to be uh, the assistant to the GM of the Yankees minor league triple A team at the mm -hmm. time. And, you know, I, I had that and um, I had another opportunity to get into kind of inter interactive digital marketing. I joined an agency and I was working there and still sending out resumes to get into sports. Right. <laughs> and I got an opportunity to be an intern at Octagon, which is a big uh, sports and entertainment agency. Yeah. And so I left the digital marketing firm I was at, left Ohio, drove my car, uh, my Volkswagen Jetta with my stuff in it to uh, my grandparents' house in Yonkers, New York, you know, all the way back to where it began for me. <laughs> and I, I lived on their couch for a while while I was an intern at Octagon, and that kind of launched my career, really, in sport. Wow. The, uh, now, Octagon was in New York and Florida, right? Were they in Florida? or Octagon, at the time, was in Stanford, Connecticut. Oh, was okay. So I was commuting to Connecticut. They had other offices, D.C., I think, 
but I was in the, they're, they're not, they're in Nor Westport, Norwalk maybe now, but okay. at the time they were right across, uh, for anyone familiar with the area, right across from the WWE headquarters. Right, right. Uh, yep. I remember the flag, exit nine. The, uh, I know that, I know that area. So, all right, so while you were at Octagon, what happened uh, with your sports life? You know, you had some pretty cataclysmic things, so some really good things actually. Yeah, happened. so I was fortunate. I got um, a, an intern. I did a whole bunch of things, but I eventually got um, added to the team that was working with IBM on the Olympics. So IBM was a global sponsor of the Olympic Games um, for the Sydney 2000 Olympic and Paralympic Games. Um, they, it, w it was potentially their last, and they were going all in and had some really amazing consumer and business-to-business -business programs. And um, as part of me working with them, I, ha I was able, I had the opportunity to move to go to Sydney wow. for um, almost a year. I was in Sydney, Australia, living in Darling Harbor. Wow. And, you know, just, I remember it, it was such a great experience to do that. We had a team of, of 4,000 total people working with IBM on wow. the Olympics. I remember our rap party. It was amazing. <laughs> but, you know, you mentioned earlier relationships. Like, I, I was working with all these people and, and learning about how important relationships were mm -hmm. um, when you're part of a big team and how you kind of got to work together and how the, the, the team kind of comes together to pull off a, a massive partnership right. with the Olympic Games uh, in Australia. And so it was a learning experience for me, but so much fun. I remember coming back. I remember my boss at Octagon said that my career had just peaked um, at, at, at uh, 23. And that, that it'll never get better than the Olympics in Sydney. And I, rem I remember thinking like, huh, maybe I got to prove this guy wrong and, and do some other things in my career that are, if not better, as good as Sydney was. And it was great. Sydney was a great experience. Well, but, but Eric, I mean, again, I, I, you know, the audience listening, you know, I've known you. I mean, traveling, baseball parks, the Olympics. Man, you've, you've negotiated as an entrepreneur some pretty incredible gigs. And, yeah. uh, you know, so, uh, yeah, so, so then what was next? All right, so you, you knew a lot of people, you developed a lot of relationships. And uh, what, what happened next? You know, I, I, I was doing that for, you know, three or four or five years mm -hmm. working at Octagon um, on different partnerships, not just IBM. Mm -hmm. um, it was their last Olympics. So I moved on to work on with Nextel and MasterCard and some other clients. And I kind of got into horse racing. So one of my clients was a sponsor of horse racing. And I was really interested in, they had a, a sales model for their sponsors called group purchasing, where they brought their sponsors' products to the industry. I thought it was really forward thinking and innovative. So I joined the League of Horse Racing and the Breeders' Cup for a few years and ran their sponsorship team. Um, it's actually the two years we had a triple crown contender. It was uh, funny side and smarty jones back oh, really? to back oh, neither wow. one wow. but those were the two years and, and it was great but yeah. i missed the olympics i missed global sport mm. i wasn't doing as much out of the country so right. I, I left the horse racing league and went to img another big agency and i was there for about five years working on the world cup and the olympic um in the consulting group so world cups and olympics working with brands right. um dhl in torino italy i, I was there for a bit um, and then the big, big, big project I did there was I, I moved to China for two years. Wow. Um, never had been, and I moved for two years to, to be seconded by Johnson & Johnson. So IMG let J&J borrow me for two years and lead operations for everything they did in China around the Olympics. Wow. So it was a massive, I mean, we built a team of a thousand people. Wow. Um, all from all over the world. That, that I was responsible for building that team and for making sure what we, everything we did on site came together. And it was, it was you know, everyone says like, I've always been interested in, because I was a zoology major, should I go back and get my MBA? Because I love, I love that. I love right, being in school. Right, but people right. said, your, your MBA will never beat what you did in China for two years. So there's your MBA for you. And, and it was, it was, it was, it was the richest uh, experience, a young, you know, guy can have, I, you know, just kind of okay. learning how to do business in a country where you're the minority, mm -hmm. you know, you're not the majority and, right. and it's hard in some ways. You don't speak the language. It was hard. What, what parts of China were you, um, yeah, I'd been there for a little bit. What parts of China? I lived in Beijing. I did a lot of traveling to Shanghai, a little bit Hong Kong. And then personally, I, I was able to travel quite a bit around Asia, which was really exciting. So, oh, but I, I was stationed in Beijing for 2007 and 2008. 
So, so do, you, do you ever recognize how incredible your career was up to that point? I mean, you've had some amazing <laughs> people. You, you, you know, then, just hearing you talk about it, said, whoa, this guy's had three career peaks in his career, and he's just getting started. So, so you did that. Thanks. You developed some experience, leadership. What do you do next? So my, my, um, my, my, my client at Johnson & Johnson, uh, who had the idea to second me for two years, he and I kept talking about how Johnson & Johnson was non-endemic to sport. And there were dozens of agencies that were a part of this Olympic team. And every agency was doing great work, but they needed a guy. They needed someone to sit in, in on their side of the table, really helping them navigate the sports space versus just all these other agencies who, who couldn't by themselves they weren't neutral. They couldn't become a guide. And so it gave us the idea to launch a company called Glide Slope. And, and we did that in 2010, a boutique advisory firm in global sport focused on helping non-endemic brands like a Dow Chemical, a Citibank, a Bridgestone, a J&J. Like really, na how do you navigate the world of sport? How do you understand if it's, a, if it's the right business driver for you? And if it is, and your customers or consumers will care, about you partnering with a sport or a property, how do you leverage it throughout the organization? So it was kind of a management consulting approach right. to helping non-endemic brands leverage global sport. And we built that as founders, you know, with our own money, ne never took any outside money and built it for seven years on our own. Wow, that's, uh, that's pretty, pretty incredible. That's pretty incredible. It was great. And, and so, w w what was next? What what you learned there, and 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 where did you want to take your uh, your career from that point? Yeah. So at Glide Slope, I was in I was in charge of a lot of things. You know, you wear a lot of hats when you're building a business. But I really kind of embraced. We we really tried as entrepreneurs for the first couple of years. This is I think a good learning um, for those who are listening. You know, we kind of split up everything the first couple of years amongst the leadership, and then we realized it'd be better to look at where you're each good and have you focus all on that right. versus do a little of everything. So my uh, areas of focus evolved into business development, mm -hmm. business operations, and people and culture. Right. So I kind of shepherded all those for us, you know, not by myself, but I was kind of leading them for the business and right. company. And I really saw the difference that the people culture side made to our success. Yeah. I mean, this is gonna. This is what kind of launched into what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's, I, I, we were known at Glide Slope to have the best people, the best culture. We were very intentional about it. We built, you know, things like the flight plan, which was like the heartbeat of the company. It's kind of the guiding document of the business from an emotional perspective. We had the rules of the road, which is how we wanted the company to feel when you're a part of it. Right. Things that we want to, you know, observe, you know, like, you know, best intentions, assume best intentions. So, so we had all these things that we were very intentional about related to people and culture, and I really saw it make a difference. Yeah. And so when we were we were acquired in 2017 by a private equity backed agency, global agency. And I just knew, like, I would help integrate the business, but I just knew I didn't want to be part of a bigger global right. company. It was good, right. good for a lot of our team, but for me, I wanted to keep on this entrepreneurial journey, and I saw opportunity to keep working on the people culture side. Mm. Well, see, and, and that's, uh, I mean, that's your sweet spot, you know, as I've gotten to know you. I mean, just um, um, you're just extraordinary at it, at developing relationships. I don't know anybody who's better than you at, at developing relationships. Thanks, you know. So, um, you know, we're, uh, we're now uh, at the halfway point where, Eric, we're going to take a commercial and we're going to talk about Human Advantage, uh, this group that, uh, uh, that you founded. And, uh, you know, I'm part of, the, part of the team and it's really exciting where it's, where it's, where it's been where it's going, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. So we will be back an Entrepreneur's State of Mind right after this commercial break.
So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. Welcome back to Entrepreneur State of Mind. I'm your host, Dr. Dale Caldwell. We're talking to Eric Gutoff, who, who is the founder of Human Advantage, but uh, has had one of the most uh, amazing careers in sports that I know of. Um, and so, uh, so we're just getting to talk about a human advantage. So he's, he's seen the Olympics, he's, he's done things with baseball, and now human advantage. And, and so Eric, and, and I'm one of, the, uh, one of the consultants as part of human advantage. So Eric, when you founded human advantage, what were you thinking? What was your, what was your vision? Yeah, it's, um, it's really about a gap in the marketplace and seeing where there's value that isn't being brought. And so when um, I had mentioned before the break that um, my company, GlideSlope, was acquired, and when I left, um, I started working for an executive search firm called Grace Blue. Great company, family-founded, boutique search firm focused in the media and agency spaces. Mm, okay. And so naturally, we thought we could make a, a connection between the media agency worlds and the sports world, which you can. Mm -hmm. um, and I was out trying to build their um, uh, business in the whole ecosystem of sports. So mm -hmm. think about sports and sports betting and right. esports and sports tech, sports media, leagues, teams, agencies, you name it. And what I found doing that for about a year and a half is that the, the, the acquiring of talent is very important and, right. and, and it's a piece mm -hmm. of a much bigger puzzle. And at least in the sports ecosystem, I found that there wasn't a resource to help these organizations in the bigger puzzle. Mm -hmm. Right. It was right. all focused really on their a lot of a lot of executive search and finding talent. Mm -hmm. And so that gave me the idea to form Human Advantage mm -hmm. as a advisory firm that would partner with organizations in the sports ecosystem and help them become leaders in people culture and really differentiate themselves to their clients, to their investors, to their, their employees, to future employees. And, you know, it was, it was pre-pandemic and it was before this even became more and more talked about, but it was already back in 2019 when I started Human Advantage and left Grace Blue, it was really starting to gain momentum already. Um, this idea of how you can be a, a leader in people culture and that, that makes a big difference. Right, right. The uh, I mean, the timing was perfect, really, because you know, people value and understand the importance of people more than ever before. And so, um, you know, it's been a wonderful to be on this journey with you. And uh, uh, we've had some pretty major clients in a short, short period of time in, in professional soccer and some other places. So talk yeah, about the experience. How, how's it going with Human Advantage? Yeah, well, the, the, um, the idea was really, if anyone's familiar with the Marvel hero, superhero, Avenger concept, okay. or, um, you know, the, the, the Avengers... Um, are, are a superhero team um, that, that come together and work together to defeat, you know, evil. And I, I kind of took the concept of trying to find Avengers that could work across, <clears throat> excuse me, that can work across people and culture. So, you know, what I did is there are people that are, that are experts in DEI, um, there are people that are experts in, in HR, there are people that are experts in leadership, we have someone that deals in organizational flow and culture. And the idea was to blend all these people like you would a superhero team to partner with a client so that they can tap into this team as it might be needed. So a lot of our work is project-based and we'll focus on one particular thing like how do we help an organization build an inclusive culture, specific project, key deliverables. And then, you know, another might be, um, you know, how do we help uh, a, 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 a newly formed organization build a strong foundation in HR? Another might be, how do we um, develop um, managers into leaders of an organization? Those are all kind of project driven. And then we also have a model where you can tap into the entire team as, a, as an Avenger team and, and use us as a resource kind of surrounding your leadership team. So, so our, our clients are mostly the leadership, including HR, of an organization and, and we become a resource that they can tap into and a partner that they can count on to help them as they as they grow. 
and, and, and providing executive coaching as well, too, is a, is a big, a big part yeah. of it. And so um, have you been surprised at how well received Human Advantage has been so quickly and it's uh, so early in its, its formulation? Well, I've been su- I've been surprised. I mean, we 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 waged through a pandemic, which was was challenging, you know, and that was it's it's not over. It's still going on. Um, we're just starting to go from doing a lot virtually to doing some virtual, some in person. And that's been great. I, I'm I'm, su- I'm I, I'm not surprised to be honest with you. I I knew there was a need, you right, know, for right. this. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that it's just getting started. I think you know companies are just starting to realize that developing their people and paying attention to culture is really important to be successful and sustainable. You can't grow sustainably if you're not paying attention to people development and culture development. And at our heart, that's really what we're doing, people development and culture development. Well, you know, our audience in- includes people running businesses of all sizes, from very small to very large. And, and um, you know, what kinds of things should they be looking at that at a human advantage can help um, you know, a sports organization uh, uh, deal with. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that the 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 first thing is it's important to look at all this holistically. Mm-hmm. Like you can't culture is connected to um, DEI, which is connected to HR and people, which is connected to leadership, and right. all of it's connected to your business. So, my, my biggest piece of advice is to ask yourself the question: Do you have a business strategy? And if the answer is yes, which it should be then you should ask, do you have a people and culture strategy that are going to help you succeed with your business strategy? And if the answer is no, then you should call us because we can help you think about the people culture strategy and prioritize your efforts against what's going to make the biggest impact to your people and your business. And so that, that's really um, the, the overarching question is, do I have a people culture strategy in place that is going to help me fuel the business vision and strategy being successful. And the name Human Advantage is just so perfect for that. And, and it's, it, it's, it really is extraordinary how little attention many sports organizations pay to their people other than the high, highly paid athletes that they have. And that their people can make uh, the difference between ex- being extraordinarily successful or being mediocre or, or, or even, even failing. What, what are it's some of the... the changing pro- them. It, 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 it's, it's amazing. It really is. Um, you want to talk about, you don't have to mention specific clients, but some of the projects that Human Advantage has been working on, you know, over the last year. So, so um, we, um, a lot of our projects lead into other projects. So for one client, we helped them, um, you know, they were thinking about doing a training in, in DE&I, um, and, and we really, what they needed was to get leadership um, aligned and educated on the, the journey they were going to go on as an organization and then build a strategy. So, you know, DEI should be something that lives and breathes throughout an organization every day. And in order to do that, you can't just do a training. And so um, we worked with um, a, a professional soccer team to help them create a, a very customized DEI strategy and kind of roadmap for where they would want to go and how to infuse it throughout the company. And now that's leading into some other things. So, you know, how DEI might be connected to developing leaders, like that's our next conversation. And, you know, they had a DEI council that was formed and they want to evolve it. So a lot of our work is strategic and advisory, but we also, it leads to other things that kind of flow out of it. Um, we, we've done some workshops that led to executive coaching, We've done some HR strategic work and building kind of an HR strategy that led to DEI work. Um, and so I think it just goes back to that interconnected group of people that can be a resource on these things and getting to know the organizations. You know, we do, I would say maybe half our work in 2021 has been around the kind of you know, space of developing leaders. People are realizing that it's very costly to keep finding new people. Yep. And, and so it's, it's better to focus on developing your people into, you know, leaders of the company. Um, and, and even, you know, um, we, we don't only develop leaders. We also work with new and junior staff or, or new staff to an organization and help them build some kind of the basic foundations for, for business. So I just think that, 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 that um, very little attention was put on this side of the business until recently, and it's just kind of like a snowball rolling down a hill. 
and those that are doing it are really differentiating themselves. They talk about, you know, I'll, 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 I'll end with, you know, they talk about the great resignation. Well, the great resignation is happening because people are looking for this. They're looking for a place where there is a strong culture and they feel they can be developed and there is collaboration. And so, you know, I think, I think what we do goes hand in hand with, um, you know, being successful in keeping your people and finding great people. Well, and, and, and one of the, one of my last clients, uh, or one of my last uh, interviews was around this, this digital company that was talking about um, more and more companies are, are using the digital platform to hire and identify um, new people. And these, these folks were young folks and they were saying, you know, the pandemic got people to think about their quality of life and that companies, and that's why they, they've, they've resigned and other things. And so I think the human advantage, advantage, if you will, is that we're helping, um, helping companies value employees in new and exciting ways. You know, one of the things that we talk about, Eric, a lot is, is reboarding. This idea of, of, uh, of, yeah, they've been part of the company, but they're reboarding after the pandemic, coming back in the office, and that looks very different, and leadership needs to look very different. And so uh, it's yeah. really exciting, uh, you know, some of the things that Human Advantage is working on. And companies are struggling with not just, like, how many days should you be back in the office, but what do you do when you're in the office right. versus out, and how do you be efficient and productive? And so this whole reboarding concept, it's a whole new way of working, and there's no blueprint to figure it out. And so it's kind of combining a lot of thinking and best practices, and, and yeah, we do, we, we're doing that with a lot of clients as well. That's important, you know. Well, we're, we're almost at the end of time, but one of the things that Human Advantage, and I've been involved with this, with the, the diversity, equity, and inclusion, is I remember years ago, I was looking at the Sports Business Journal and looking at the 30 under 30, and there were like two African Americans and like two women in that whole thing. And so the sports industry, is as diverse as it may be on the field or on the court, really hasn't been. And so Human Advantage has been playing a, a real role in helping companies understand all aspects of, of diversity. And it's been going very well and, and being very well received. I, I would venture to say Human Advantage is becoming one of the leading sports DEI consulting firms out there, wouldn't you say, Eric? Yeah, and I think, you know, we, it's because we approach it with a strategic lens and yeah. we approach it understanding how it's connected to all these other areas of a business. And that's, I think, our special sauce is, is there are great companies out there, but our approach is really making sure that um, the DEI work done is sustainable and, and it's a journey. Excellent. Well, we're, we're at the end of time. Eric, if, if a company wants to get a, a hold of you or, or an executive, what's the website or how do they get a hold of Human Advantage? Yeah, so you can, um, um, the, the email is ahumanadvantage.com. So you can email me, it's eric.gutoff at ahumanadvantage.com. Or if it's easier, you can email hello at ahumanadvantage.com. And that would be a way, that's on, that's on the website as well. That would be a way to get in touch and then start a conversation. Wonderful. Well, Eric, thanks so much for your time. And audience, I want to thank you once again for watching Entrepreneur State of Mind. Again, I'm your host, Dr. Dale Caldwell, and we will see you next week. Eric, thanks again. Great, great, uh, great conversation. Take care. Thanks for having me, Dale. Appreciate right. it. Bye-bye.